Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Has anyone come to praise the Lord? Amen. In 2023. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 It's a new year, and I don't know about you, but I want to give God a new praise today. Hallelujah. It's a new year, and I want to give him renewed worship. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Amen. It's a new season. It's a new time, and it's time for a new praise. It's time to give God a new song. Hallelujah. Because we've made it this far by his grace. How many know that this morning? We, we are here by his grace, by his power alone. Hallelujah. And only he deserves the praise today. For a few moments, can we just do that right now? Just worship God. Worship God with all your soul. Give him good worship. Worship in spirit. Worship in truth. Hallelujah. This morning, we love you, Jesus. We lift our hands to you, God. We lift our voices to you today, Jesus. You're worthy. You're worthy of it all, God, and only you are worthy. Lord, not to us, God, but to your name be the glory, Jesus. To your name be the glory, God, not to us and anything we've done, God, but because it's by your grace that we are here, Lord. We offer you a new song today, God. We offer you a new praise, God. We offer you worship in spirit and in truth today. We lift our voice to your name because you are worthy. Hallelujah. You are worthy, God, today. Come on, church. Let's praise him. Let's worship him today. Let's give him what he deserves. Oh, yes, God. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know, perhaps some are a little behind today because they stayed up a bit too late. Amen. But I'm going to tell you this. We're going to start the fire. Amen. So that when they get in here, it's burning hot. Hallelujah. It's burning hot with praise. It's burning hot with the Holy Ghost. Amen. We're going to start this thing off right. Amen. We're going to start 2023 off right. Praising the Lord Jesus and giving him the glory. Can we just shout to the Lord today and give him the honor and glory that he deserves? We love you, Jesus.
problem that my God can't solve. And never has there been a question that in the mind of God. But He's given us the power to rise above our enemies. Oh, nothing's too big for God, no impossibility. Oh, nothing's too big for my God. Somebody believe that today. Nothing's too big for my God. Oh, no situation is too big for my God.
always roaming to and fro out the land. He's seeking whom he might devour. Oh, but he was defeated at Golgotha. That day when Jesus, he made him out a liar. I know that Jesus is with me when the storm comes. He's standing by my side. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh God, you're so good. You're so good to us. Ooh, I love our child. They say this mountain can't be moved And they say these chains will never break But they don't know you like we do There is power in your name We've heard that there is no way through We've heard the tide will never change They haven't seen what you can do There is power in your name So much power in your name Move the earth, move up
Oh God, I believe for it, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Why don't we lift our hands and worship Him today? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, let the Holy Ghost have its way today. Come on now. Let him flow, let him flow. Oh, he's moving, he's moving in this place. Come on. Somebody get him the Holy Ghost. Somebody pray in the Spirit. Somebody pray in the Spirit today. Thank you, God. Oh, God is doing a new thing in the Holy Ghost today. Hallelujah. He's doing a new thing among his people. He's moving in such a deep way today. And the best thing that we could do is give in. Just give in. Just submit. Just let go and let the Spirit carry you. Let the Spirit transform you. Let the presence of God do a mighty work in your life. One more time, church. Can we just lift our hands and worship Him? Kodosha. Let's worship Him today. Let's worship Him today. Let's worship Him today. Oh, we love you. We love you. We love you, God. Oh, hallelujah. Ooh, thank you God it's hard to know what to say because there's so much going on in the Holy Ghost God's working on an individual level he's working as in, uh, on the congregation as a whole there's so much going on in the spirit amen God is doing a mighty work in our lives amen I have no doubt that we're going to hear a word from the Lord today we're going to meet with God today amen Ooh, thank you Jesus Thinking about the kingdom prayer that we pray every single week, every time we come together as a church. I felt the Lord minister in my heart today something to say. As we proceed into this new year, as we proceed in believing in God for revival, hallelujah, for revival, amen. I believe that as we enter into this new year, that God is going to bring about a canceling force that follows us wherever we go because the power and the presence of God is with us we're going to cancel the strategy of Satan we're going to cancel the plan of the enemy in our jobs 
wherever you go and the power of God goes with you you're gonna cancel the plan of Satan for your friends for your family for your job hallelujah we're gonna break the back of the strength of Satan today hallelujah we're gonna break the back of the authority of the enemy hallelujah and we're gonna claim it in Jesus name there will be revival in this city there will be revival with his people can we just pray right now in the name of Jesus Lord we come before you Jesus we come before you Lord God we give you the glory father for the presence that we feel here in this place we give you the glory God for the power father that we feel God in the atmosphere Jesus and right now God we pray in the name of Jesus that you would continue working a mighty move of your spirit God in our midst work it in our families work it in our city God and right now I pray God that you would cancel the plan of Satan for 2023 God you would cancel it in the name of Jesus as we walk in your will as we walk in your authority as we walk in your power God give us dominion by your name give us dominion by your blood give us dominion by your spirit God we command the north to give up its souls we command the south we command the east and the west to give up its souls that the house of God may be flooded God that it may be flooded God with souls that are hungry and thirsty God let a fire grip us God let a fire God get a hold of us today visit us with Pentecost God visit us with apostolic demonstration and let your kingdom come and let your will be done on earth, God. Let it be done on earth, God. Let it be done on earth as it is in heaven. In the name of Jesus, we pray. In the name of Jesus. Can we just clap our hands to the Lord in a spirit of victory? Oh, praise him with victory in your spirit. Come on, somebody praise him with victory in your spirit today. We give you the glory, God. We give you the glory. We give you the glory. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. If you have a need today, I believe God can respond to whatever you need you may have. You may have come into this new year with that need, but there is nothing too hard for the Lord. How many believe that today? Whether it be sickness, whether it be financial, whether it be something specific, it doesn't matter. God can respond and God can meet you in that need. And if you have faith today that God can meet you in that need, why don't you raise your hand today and we're going to pray for you. And we're going to gather together with you because God is going to make a way. He's going to demonstrate victory because good Jesus has never lost a battle. Hallelujah. If you have faith, why don't you just raise your hand. And church, if you see a hand that's around you, we're going to pray for the people of God today. We're going to pray for these individuals who are claiming in faith that they believe that God is going to show up. He's going to make Take away in the name of Jesus. Lord, Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you today. Lord, every single need, God, that's in this building, Lord Jesus, you see it, you know it, God, the sickness, Lord God, the provision that's needed, God, I pray that you would make a way today. Make a way today. Demonstrate your power, God, as we reach, God, towards you with hunger, God, to see you. Lord, Father, demonstrate your spirit, God, in our lives, Lord, that we may be a testimony of your greatness, that when we would be a testimony of your goodness, in the name of Jesus, make a way, God. Have your way. Have your way, God, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Do it, God. Do it, God, in this place. Do it, God, in this place. Thank you, Jesus. You can make your way back to your seats, but let's remain standing. We only have a few announcements. Amen. This morning. As many of you know, if you've been here for any amount of time, there is a special event that happens every January. Amen. It's called Landmark. Hallelujah. A great time of revival, not just for this church, but also for the whole of the apostolic movement. Amen. 
And in the coming weeks, you just, uh, I, I, uh, we, we would like you to be aware that we are going to go into several days of prayer and fasting on Monday, January 9th through Wednesday, January 11th. And I know God is going to visit us. We're going to consecrate ourselves so that God would have his way. Amen. And he would move in a tremendous way. Hallelujah. Throughout the conference. How many believe God is going to visit us? Amen. In Landmark. Amen. At this mo moment, I would like to invite Sister Kayla Puente. She has a special announcement as well. Praise the Lord, Christian Life Center. I have a very exciting announcement to make. And it has been announced the past few Sundays, but I thought I'd get up here and announce it and get some pool. This landmark is our 50th landmark. It is going to be amazing. It is going to be wonderful. It has been 50 years that we have had this wonderful conference. And we are doing a landmark choir, woo! <laughs> and I am reaching out to you today. If you have not come to our choir practices and have joined the choir yet, come January 5th to our practice. We need you. We want our choir to be big. We want you to represent CLC up here during landmark. This is your church. We want our choir to be big. We want you to be a part of it. If you're a worshiper, we want you a part of it. If you're a singer, we want you a part of it. If you're a dancer, we want you a part of it as long as you don't run off and fall off, <laughs> you know. But we want you a part. So please, if you have not yet gotten involved in the Landmark Choir, come January 5th to our practice at the West Lane at 7 p.m. We want you there. God bless you. Hallelujah. It's now time for our Sunday morning tithing offering. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We still celebrate giving. Amen. Because God blesses a cheerful giver. And we have been sure to make our declarations, declaring to us and declaring to those around us that we believe that God, he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Amen. Amen. Let's say this together today. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. Upon the authority of the word of God, we declare that the Lord is our provider. As one who tithes and gives offering, I am entitled to his blessings and protection from the attacks of the enemy. Therefore, I bring my tithe and offering into your storehouse today, knowing that my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. For employees, we claim good jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, promotions and benefits and favor with our employers and customers in the workplace. For business owners, we claim favorable contracts and growth and that these businesses will be profitable and a blessing to the kingdom. For his people, the Lord shall supply income, inheritances, estates, interest, rebates, unexpected gifts and blessings, bills and debts will be paid off, allowing me to live debt free. Since spiritual blessings follow the giver, I declare that my whole family is saved and in relationship with God. We receive perfect health, healing, deliverance, and walking in the divine favor and blessing of the Almighty. I am blessed coming in and going out, and all that I put my hand to do will prosper in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you today. God bless you as you give. On the floor, you may march. On the balcony, they will wait on you.
Let's uh, stand this morning, and uh, this is one of those Sundays where in our city, for you that are watching online and the surrounding areas, much of the electricity went off yesterday, and it is still off today in a good bit of this area. Even our own household has no electricity, but we're here. But we did get some uh, people telling us they couldn't make it because their electricity's out. A good excuse to stay home, right? <laughs> so, but uh, anyway, I know that there's some uh, people that are not able to watch us even online because of that. But uh, the presence of the Lord is here. It's in a very special way in this building. And what I have learned through the years is that oftentimes when things like this happen, the Lord sends a little something special to undergird the people that gather in his name so that that will be a special moment in time for them. And I've already felt God's presence in this building. I know that you have. And I believe that people that are able to watch are feeling the same thing from some of the comments that have come in. And this service is not through yet. God is going to pour out of His Spirit in a mighty way this Sunday morning. Praise God. Praise God. And one of the things people have to understand is that Crowd dynamics are a beautiful thing. They work oftentimes uh, for God's people. And there's an energy in each person, in a, na a natural energy that we have that God's given us out of our soul, out of our, uh, the energy of the human life. And when that's excited and that kind of meshes with other people and then connects with God, there's this oftentimes this giant surge of worship and and excitement that just makes a service beautiful. Well, when our eyes look around and see that the crowd's down and the dynamics of that extra human energy that motivate, and because we feed off each other, that's the way humans are designed, is down, there is usually a little downer that takes place and we kind of just drive through, maybe we could say on autopilot, or we just kind of mosey on through. It's many times if we realize in those moments <laughs> that what we lack in the dynamic of crowds, energies joining together, God will give us the supernatural energy. Praise the Lord. And it's not that we don't have a crowd. In some churches, we couldn't fit. Some church buildings, there's a, God's, a, God has a lot of people in Stockton, but it's not our normal size crowd here today. But what I do feel is that God has made the difference with that Holy Ghost energy that is pulsating in the hearts and in this service today. Praise God. And I know that God is going to do great, great things in our lives. Praise the Lord. If you're a visitor here, we are really glad that you came to be with us today in this service. And we, we welcome you and hope that you will come back and worship again with us. Uh, we plan to be here every Sunday till the Lord calls us home. Amen. We're the light of the world and the salt, uh, and uh, we, we have a purpose here. Amen. I'm going to read today from the book of uh, 2 Peter, and while you're turning there, maybe would you just spin around or turn next and greet someone and tell them it's good to see you on the first day of 23 or 2023. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Well, we're going to read from 
the second uh, chapter of Second uh, Peter, and I am going to start with verse 4, and it says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation, that word conversation also encompasses lifestyle, uh, thought pattern, actions. It's the totality of a human being. So it wasn't just things he heard them say, it was everything he observed them doing. And so it says that he, he was vexed with their filthy way of life of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. You know, Christians need their soul to be vexed with the unrighteousness around them once in a while. We cannot become complacent where we just get to a place where we're numb and we just accept what is around us, and we just say, this is normal. But there ought to be something in a child of God whose soul gets vexed when we see and we hear and we look upon what the filth of the wicked are doing on this planet. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation. And to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Praise God. You can be seated. And I wanna, I'm going to preach from this passage today. I feel that God wants me to talk to us here at the first of the year. Um, I believe in making commitments and uh, turning new leaves. I, I'm not against that. But I don't believe that you should have to wait to the first of the year. I think every time somebody comes down to this altar and repents, that's the first of the year for them. Praise God. I think every time somebody has struggled and been through a trial and finally gets that Bethel with God and gets a hold of God and prays through it, it don't matter what day of the year it is, that's a new beginning for them. And we make commitments. And, and, uh, and so... Uh, but there are many, many people that have the tradition that they will wait till that new year to make their commitments, and then they will endeavor to make changes going forward. And the truth of the matter is, most of those people are going to fail. Hey, Larry, can you turn that down? It's competing with me. Thank you. And... Uh, it, they make their commitments, but they don't last as long as they should last because they're usually commitments about losing weight, uh, exercising, getting up earlier, getting up, you know, it's, it's all usually natural things. But I'm talking to some people that we want to make some commitments spiritually that two months from now when the gyms are empty... <laughs> and everybody's quit following through on that new leaf, we're going to be blowing and going in the Spirit because the commitment we're making is about eternal things and about the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. And so today in this service, 
I want to talk to you about this passage of Scripture. Now, verse 4 says, And if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Now, there's a couple things that we notice that are happening here. First is, is that there are some angels that sinned, uh, a sin that was so grievous that they were not allowed to stay loose and continue to be evil in the world. Uh, Satan and the angels that fell with him never were bound, never were arrested, never were put in hell, never were put in prison, but they are loose. And he is the God of this world, and the angels that are working with him, the fallen angels, are the principalities. They're like the governors, uh, the prime ministers, they're the 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 the, 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 the top leaders, and then the foot soldiers of that are the demon powers, and that's kind of just the simple version there. And they're loose. They've never been in bondage. But these angels committed such a grievous sin that when God was ready to deal with them, he captured them and he put them in hell. Now, from this, we understand they're waiting in hell because in the future, there's going to be a judgment for them that's going to punish them forever. You know what that tells us? Hell is not a final resting place for anybody. It's only a holding tank until we get to the great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment is the final judgment of all humanity before eternity begins. And of course, the church will not have to go to that judgment because you and I have been judged at the altar through the blood of Jesus and the cross. And so the church bypasses that because our judgment is taking place right now as we sit here under the blood of Jesus and the mercy and grace of God through Calvary in Christ. Praise the Lord. But those that have not come through the water and have not come filled with the Spirit and have not been washed in the blood, their final judgment still awaits them at the great white throne judgment. And this is the judgment of these angels. These angels came down from heaven to earth during what we call the antediluvian age. And the antediluvian age was a period of time that we don't have a lot of information about, but it was before the great flood of the time of Noah. And it was the people that lived in that era of time. And these angels came down and they saw the beautiful women that were born to humans, and they began to take these women and marry them, and they were able to cross species and produce offspring. Now, I know today a lot of people think that's just crazy and, and, and that, you know, you're, you're kind of wacko to believe that. Well, uh, I don't know where you get that kind of thinking, but there's a lot of things that you and I don't understand about the different dimensions and the different parts of creations that someday we'll understand a lot better. And, uh, but there was a time where the uh, spirit world could cross species. It was not the will of God, uh, but it was something that happened. And they produced a giant race upon this earth. And the people of that era of time became so wicked that the Bible says that the imagination, the thinking process of the, of the angels that fell and the humans that were here and the cross species became so vile that continually, 24-7, as long as their minds were able to think, they devised wicked, evil imaginations and they multiplied, they compounded. All they could do was think about how to become more evil and do more evil things. And God got to a place where he said, that kind of wickedness is so vile to me. It's not, they don't even take a rest and laugh and live a little life and do something bad. They constantly are doing evil. And God said, I'm going to punish them. And so we have a flood that takes place. Uh, the cross species, which were those that had uh, humanity attached to them and the humans, the water was able to destroy them and wipe them out. 
However, the angels uh, cannot die with a natural, so God took them and put them in a place of darkness. Jude talks about this. He said those angels went after strange flesh, and then he gives the example of Sodom and Gomorrah going after strange flesh. A man going after a man is strange to God. It's wrong. An angel going after a human is strange to God. It's wrong. And so he uses this example here. And then he goes on in the book of Peter, and he talks about the next situation that takes place. And he says, uh, and the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them with an overthrow, making them an example. So Sodom and Gomorrah is an example for the ungodly world to understand that there is a reckoning day that is going to take place for every sinner. The Bible says it in, in, in this way. It says, uh, the wages of sin are death. Most of us that have a job, we work for wages. Wages is what somebody pays us when we give them our time, our talents, and our energies. And so if I go down and I ask to get a job at Home Depot and they hire me, I'm going to give them so many hours a week. And if I have expertise in plumbing or expertise in electricity or something, then maybe I'll be a specialist in that area and they'll pay me a little more for that special little extra talent. If I go to the hospital and I'm a nurse or I'm a doctor, uh, I'm going to be paid by that hospital that I'm working with or those patients for my time, the time I spent in school, the energy, their wages. And so I give them something and then they give me something back. God says people that give themselves to sin the wages of sin. When you work to sin and you work to do ungodliness, God is going to give them a paycheck someday according to all of the hours that they have stocked up on their time card doing evil against His will. And that paycheck, when they go to cash it, will be a paycheck of eternal death, separation for God. So it's a very serious thing to live in sin. Now, to be a sinner and to uh, fall into sin is not a terrible thing because that's human. The poet said, to err is human. What is a terrible thing is when we do not repent and do not acknowledge our sins and do not get right with God. In other words, what I'm saying is failure and sins and making mistakes from time to time, that's just being a human being. God understands that's going to happen, but He's made a way of escape through repentance. You better take it and better get right with God. That's the way that it works. So he says these people in Sodom and Gomorrah, they became so vile and so wicked that uh, when he destroyed them, he used that example going forward that they would be the example of what's going to happen to the ungodly and the wicked, and of course understand that would not repent. Now repentance can cancel out just about anything. you got to understand that. It's powerful when it's sincere. But when people do not repent and persist in their wicked and evil ways, there is not going to be any hope for them. So it's an example for them. Now let me read on to you. It says that uh, God turned the city of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. So whenever you think about living ungodly, you should think of Sodom and Gomorrah and realize there is a reckoning day that will come. Verse 7, And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Now let me say something. When we read the story of Lot in the Old Testament, we don't see a righteous man. At least I don't. You may see one there. I don't. I see a man that's weak. I see a man that has made bad decisions. 
I see a man that has led his family astray. I see a man that is tolerant of sin. I see a man that has even been influenced in his thinking by those around him. But I also have to remember that he didn't have a Bible. He never had a Bible to read. There wasn't even a law of Moses that told him right and wrong. He was having to go by conscience. He never had an experience in the Holy Ghost. What would we may have looked like if we didn't have those three powerful things? He never knew about Jesus. So in light of that background, he was a righteous man because what was going on, he knew was wrong and it bothered him. How much more should people of faith with all of the things I just mentioned in your life be bothered by the gross darkness that is in the world today? There is no excuse for Christians not to be stirred up with the filth and perversion and the ugliness of sin that is in the world. There should be something that rises up with us, a holy anger, a vexation of soul at what's going on. And we should go to God in prayer, and we should beseech God that He would bring a great revival, and that He would bring down unrighteousness, and that He would cause us to be a light that would shine and pierce the darkness, that it might not comprehend the light that is in us as the candles of the world. Praise God. And the Bible says that he was vexed by this. It was a terrible time that was upon the earth. It was a time of ugliness. Now it's amazing that these two people that Peter is talking about are also two people that Jesus talked about in Matthew 24. He did in other places too, but especially there. And he talks about as it was in the days of Noah so shall it also be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man, which is the close of the tribulation, is the time of the tribulation. And so as we get closer to the church being raptured and the world heading to that seven-year period that we call Daniel's 70th week when there's going to be seals and trumpets and judgments and catastrophes upon the earth and God pouring out His wrath upon the wicked and the ungodly, we are going to be seeing more and more darkness and more and more evil that is trying to rise up and lift its ugly head in the world and come and take its place before its time. Now hear me. Not everything that's happening in the world is happening because God says it's the time. But it's because the church has not stopped it from happening. There will be a time where the church is going to be removed. And all of this wicked that is bubbling under the surface is going to bust up like artesian wells and fill this world like the floods of Noah that covered the earth in water. There are going to be floods of filth and wickedness and evil that's going to cover the earth in gross darkness. But right now it's trying to come up and yet the church is still here on the earth. God has not removed us. So we are at an impasse. Either we will hold back that which is trying to come before its time or we will just be driven into a corner and accept the wickedness and say there's nothing we can do. Let's just hold on until the Lord removes us. I feel like preaching. I know it's a New Year's and a lot of people had parties last night and, and a lot of Christians kind of got in the Christmas spirit and the holiday seasons and everything and, and, and it's kind of hard to get back on track. Well, I'll tell you, your pastor is on track today. I've been in prayer, I've been with God and I feel the Holy Ghost. Uh, and I'm going to get you on track this morning because I'm going to preach the word of the Lord to you. 
God's going to come down and He's going to set some of you right where you need to be for this year because we're going to do something for God in 2023. There's going to be a move of God in this region. Huh? And all of heaven is coming down and hell is going to know there is a church to reckon with because we are the people of the Most High God. Huh? Oh, hallelujah. I'm not afraid of the devil. I'm not afraid of the powers of darkness. I'm not afraid of evil. And I'll tell you one simple reason why. Because I know in whom I believe. And he is in control of all things. And greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And Jesus talked about these people and he said when you see the tribulation coming and you see the filth of the world and then those people in the tribulation, they're going to see all of this stuff happening on on, on levels that are unprecedented. And we're living in a time where the enemy knows that we are at the close of this dispensation. I know some people don't believe in dispensations, and I really am in a place I could care less what they believe. I'm so sick and tired of people trying to fight all the things the Scripture is so clear about. If you don't want to believe the Bible, that's your problem. If you don't want to believe the way the Bible teaches, you you got issues. I don't, they're not my issues. They're your issues. And I'm not so much speaking to people here, but people that are listening You need to make up your mind how you're going to interpret this thing, what grid, what system of hermeneutics you're going to use, and you need to stick with it and say, this is how we're going to understand the Word of God. We're going to take it as literal as it allows us to and find literal meaning in every symbol and every parable and every story because God meant for us to understand the Word of the Lord. He never intended that we wouldn't know what this book is talking about. But we're in a dispensation. That is a time where God has put in the hands of humanity His plan, His will, His teachings, and we are to manage that by living it, obeying it, and, and, and preserving it through this era of time. But when this dispensation is closed, the church age is closed, then God is going to come in with judgment, which is how it always ends. And so it's important that we stay focused on what God has for us. Now let me read verse 8 here. It says, For the righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. In verse 9, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation. Praise God. Now, I want to read another verse of Scripture, and I'd like to take you to uh, the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 60. Now, this passage that I'm going to read to you is actually a prophecy, it's prophetic prediction of the kingdom age uh, and the close of the tribulation. And what the kingdom age is, is when the church heir of time is gone, that God's going to rapture the church, then there'll be a tribulation, then there's going to be a thousand-year period of time where Christ is going to physically rule this earth as its king. Like other men have tried to be the king of the entire known world, well, there's only one man can do that. That's the man, Christ Jesus. And he's going to do it, and he's going to rule from Israel. Uh, Jerusalem is his capital. And he then, at the end of that thousand years, he's going to take Satan, who has been in bondage or in what we call a bottomless pit, For a thousand years, he's going to let him loose. Now, he's not in a bottomless pit today. 
He's loose. He's doing his work. But there will be a day he's going to be put in there. That man, that, that devil is going to go and tempt all the human beings that are born here for the thousand years. He's going to try to get them to turn on Christ, and many of them are. And then they're going to come up against the Lord in Jerusalem, and he's going to destroy them, and then he's going to raise the dead from Adam to that moment, and he's going to line them up, and there's going to be a long, long judgment, which we mentioned earlier in this uh, service as the great white throne judgment. And there'll be one group of people, and I have to always say this because it's so wonderful to be able to say it, that will be absent from that long line of judgment. That'll be the body of Christ. We will not be there because we have been judged, and I want the devil to hear it. I've already been judged at the altar. I've already been judged by the blood of Jesus. My sins are washed away. I've been redeemed by the cross and the work of the cross. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so this is, the, this is what the prediction is. Uh, but I want to read it to you because it has a way of conveying really what we're facing as we close out the church age. And let me read a few verses. Arise and shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth. And gross darkness, the people. Now, I want you to think about it. Wherever there is an Adamic nature, that's a nature of sinfulness that we inherited from the first set of humans, Adam and Eve, there will always be a darkness that is very dark that rests upon human beings. It's just the way that it'll be. There'll be a darkness on the earth. (laughs) But God, this is what I want to point out, always has an answer for darkness. Wherever there's spiritual darkness, wherever the devil comes in like a flood, wherever the nature of humanity becomes so vile because of its, its rebellion and its, and its transgressions against the Most High God, God has an answer. And no matter how great darkness is, God's answer is always. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. It says, but the Lord, everybody say the Lord, shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee, and the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. Lift up thine eyes round about and see, all they gather themselves together, they come to thee. Thy son shall come from far, and thy daughter shall be nursed at thy side. The point here in this is very applicable to what we're facing today. We are at the end of this era time before God moves in, raptures the church, brings a judgment, and closes this dispensation down. And uh, darkness always comes in great measures at certain times before God judges people. Let's take, uh, let's take Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Their eyes were opened and they saw what they see. They saw they were naked after they had disobeyed. That what they saw did not bring the light as we think it should, it brought fear, and they hid themselves because they were afraid of facing God, because what they really saw was the sinful state they were in. And God followed up with that with judgment, and there was a tree in that garden that if they had went to that tree and would have eaten that tree, they would have lived eternally. And God sent a cherub angel and said, drive them out of the garden so they cannot have eternal life and they will die. And they drove them out. Judgment. The antediluvian age. God sent a line of righteous men to testify. Even Noah was a preacher of righteousness and he preached righteousness And he told them, and they got wicked and wicked and became so vile that even their imagination was continually. Violence filled the earth. It was was spiritual darkness. And God brought a flood and wiped them all out and killed them. 
And then we have the Tower of Babel, and God said, I want you to get yourselves together. And I want you to have a human government, and I'm going to get, let, share my government with you. I'm going to let you uh, be involved in part of the governing of humanity. And he gives them a set of, of, of a basic uh, tenets for a human government, and they rebelled against God. And God comes down and confuses their language, breaks up their family, breaks up their uh, uh, unity, and scatters them around the world. And the judgment of that is from that point on, they begin to fight amongst themselves and are still fighting amongst themselves today, killing each other off because they don't speak and look exactly alike. And so we have ethnic wars and national wars that have been taking place for thousands and thousands of years. And someone says, uh, well, the, you know, that there wasn't a great judgment, just their language was changed. My friend, there have been millions and millions and millions of people killed. Prejudiced have risen to unprecedented levels because of what God did at the Tower of Babel. Don't tell me that's not a judgment on humanity for their rebellion. But see, people don't want to face this kind of stuff. There's always a judgment. There's always a darkness that comes. And we're in what we call the church age. Some people call it the, 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 the age of grace or the dispensation of grace. I see grace in every dispensation, but I don't see a church. So I think church is the proper place, the proper name. This is the dispensation of the church. It's the time of God's people that are brought into the new covenant through Jesus Christ. And we see great darkness at the beginning with the Roman Empire. We see the dark ages and stuff like that. But actually, there is more evil and darkness today. And there's something in this time that never existed in these other eras of time, and that's called atheism. Do you know that uh, in the ancient world, they did not have atheism? They had idolatry. They had false gods, but nobody was stupid enough to say there wasn't a god. Only in the West and only in the last 100 years to 150 years has atheism become a prominent rising belief system and now has even spread to some of these Eastern countries that for thousands and thousands of years have believed in God. My friend, that is one of the most darkest belief systems in the world is to look at the handiwork of God and say, that just all appeared, nothing made it. The judgment's severe for that. And we're living in darkness where nations are embracing perversion. I don't know of any generation, and I'm quite a history uh, buff, as many of you know. I read a lot about history, not just a close history, but far and distant ancient history. Uh, and, and part of my studies was in the, the, the line of ancient history. And so in studying that, there was never a people that struggled with gender issues. Homosexuality, yes. Uh, the female counter to that, which we have termed lesbianism, uh, that. But never were people were trying to find gender like we're dealing with today. And it's not just, are you a male or female or an it? Uh, they got 67, I read, this was a couple years back. I don't know how they classify it. I mean, it's gotten so bad. Uh, telling little kids they can go to school and they get to decide what they want to be and dress the way they want to be. I, I think I read where Jesus said, if you offend one of these little ones, it would be better for a millstone to be hung around your neck. I sure wouldn't want to be one of the legislators that have pushed that and signed off on that, no matter what they claim to be, they got to face the Lord Jesus someday. The, the amount of abortions that we have seen in our world uh, of America alone, not count around the world, far outpace anything because whenever you have technology, you can do more of the same thing. And so the few abortions that were able to be had in the older days, uh, they can do these just by the thousands every hour. Now, if that's not darkness to you, you really don't have a pulse on the holiness of God. Because this is really encroaching in on God's holiness. And the Bible said to be holy for I am holy. And, and, and so I'm laying this foundation to help you understand we're living in the gross darkness. 
There's been more abortions. There's been more atheism. There has been more homosexuality. Part of it's because there's more people, but some of it is the devisement of the mind of how to articulate and how to impose evil has become so great in the world today, and we are truly struggling with this. And if we were just to look at this from a political situation, oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. If we were just looking at this from just legislation and laws of a country and a society, we would say things like this. There's nothing we can do. It's hopeless. Just exist. Just make it through. Lord, come quickly and take us out here. And we should be praying that anyway. But that shouldn't be the only prayer that's coming off our lips and out of our heart. But what we got to understand is that God, in every moment of time I talk to you about, He puts someone there as a countermeasure Oh, hallelujah. He put someone there that would stand up and would give hope and would give light for those that are coming and those that were living. Soon as they were driven out of the garden, there was a son named Seth that was born. And the Bible says, and then men begin to call on the name of the Lord. That boy, that young man, that, that kid named Seth, there was something divine about him. He was God's answer to a dark world that was without hope. When the world became so vile and so wicked, God said to Noah, he said, I want you to build an ark. And for the length of the building, anybody that wants to get in the ark, they can get in the ark and escape the judgments. And the Bible says he was a preacher of righteousness. And he preached, and God offered them hope. The Tower of Babel. God raised up Shem. He had a line that God was able to salvage out of all of that that started what we call a Jewish remnant or a Semitic remnant, which would raise up Abraham, who would bring a son from afar, a great, 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 great grandson who would redeem the world, whose name was Jesus Christ. And in the church age, as wicked and vile as the world is, the very people that are going to walk all the way to the moment in time before Antichrist comes up on the scene, the most wicked human being that will ever have lived in the course of human ever existing. And we're the generation that's going to walk up to the very moment and hand the baton and he's going to come up. And all of this spirit of Antichrist is working in our generation. Even John said that. He said it four times. He said the spirit of Antichrist is already at work among us. And there's a lot of bad things. There's murder everywhere. There's greed and corruption. There's abortions. There's lies. There's deceit. There's filth. There's perversion and there's all kinds of, of ugly and nasty that's in the world. There's hatred and there's murder. There's bitterness. And I mean, you go down the list and the whole world is angry and they're just going crazy. And the darkness is so great and it seems like churches are drying up and buildings are sitting empty and the congregations are walking away and the young people have left and the older people are small. I, I can't tell you how many churches that I've read about that they don't have anyone to carry on and they're just a small group of older people that are holding on to the property but there's no longer a church there. We're not talking even our type of uh, flavor of Christianity. We're just talking Christians in general. That's the pool of righteousness that's shrinking down because the, the, the churches of Christianity should be, even if they're not in this uh, uh, faith of the oneness apostolic, they do have the righteousness or should have the righteousness and that pool is just shrinking. And with it, it's like when the light gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer, then the darkness walks closer and closer and closer. 
you take a light in the house and you have it bright, but you have a dimmer switch, about every 20 minutes go and just turn it down a little bit. And you'll notice some shadows are coming around. Then come back a little bit later and turn the dimmer switch a little bit more down and the shadows will close in. And finally you turn it to where the light is there, but the shadows are so great that it's not really, you have to let your eyes adjust to even see. And that's what's happened in the world. The light keeps getting dimmer. The light of righteousness and righteousness and righteousness. And God says, I want you to know something when the world gets like that. (laughs) Something's going to happen. God's going to set on. (laughs) And there's going to be a great light that's going to be seen from far away. (laughs) And I'm here to preach today that this is not a day of sorrow. And this is not a day of discouragement. And this is not a day of victory for the camp of the enemy. But this is, in fact, the greatest hour and moment of God's people. Because of the darkness and the gross darkness that has come upon the world, it has enabled us to be positioned in a place uh, where God can do His greatest work through us as a people. I'm talking to a church to tell you today, uh, this world has yet to see what God is going to do through Christian Life Center. We are just a warming up for a move of God and a revival and a harvest uh, that is going to make the tails, uh, make the tongues wag and the ears itch with the stories that are going to be told because God has positioned us to do some great and mighty things in this end time. Oh, hallelujah! Now it's 10.58, and so I got another 20, 30 minutes of good preaching. I've been kind of laying a little foundation today. Hallelujah. I want to preach some of you out of your lethargy today and out of your hopelessness, and I want you to see who you are and what you are and what God's got in store for you as His people this morning. Let's go to the book of uh, Timothy, and I want to read some verses of Scripture. 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, it says, Now the Spirit, or the Holy Ghost, speaketh expressly, that in the latter times, that's our times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidden to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, nothing is to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Now let me read another verse of Scripture, and let's go to 2 Timothy and read chapter uh, uh, Three. Second Timothy chapter 3, this know also that in the last days, that's those days we're living in, started with the church uh, birth and it just keeps moving forward. In the last days, perilous times, that's terrible times, hardships, bad times, unnatural, unnormal situations are going to come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, Boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parrot, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, it's fierce, despisers of those that are good. Boy, we're seeing that. Treaties, hey, heady, uh, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Now, the fact that he's telling somebody to turn away from that is telling us that God has a true church among the church world. Hear me, I said God's got him a true people that haven't bowed. Even when Elijah, he made his complaint to God and he said, God, I only serve you. And God said, I got 7,000 that ain't even put a knee on the ground to bell yet. And I appreciate you standing up, Elijah, but I got others that are doing the same thing that aren't out there on the forefront, but their light is shining. Let me take you to chapter 4. 
And it starts in verse 2, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of the ministry. Now what I want to tell you is we're not here putting our head in the sand like a bunch of ostriches ignoring what is happening. Yes, there is people that are walking walking away from the truth. And yes, there is a world that is doing terrible things. And yes, the darkness of evil is encroaching in on this planet like it has never been before. And yes, there are people that are pretending to have the power of God, but they don't have the power of God. There's doctrines that have been corrupted with the voices of demons and demonic words. And so no longer do we have pure truth in many places, but we have diluted truth with false doctrines that is in the mainstream of Christianity. So we're not here saying that everything's rosy and we've misunderstood it. I'm here to tell you, it's a mess. It's not good. There's bad things happening. You read the newspaper. You listen to the news. You have to filter some of that because they lie so much themselves. But I mean, it's just ugly, ugly, nasty, dirty, dark, filthy, evil, satanic, uh, diabolical. Yes, it's there. But if you live in that place all the time, you're going to want to go inside your house and put a bolt on your front door and lock yourself in and have everybody deliver your food to the front doorsteps and, and, and you're going to try and just become a recluse and you're going to miss the entire reason that God allowed you to be born in this time and live during this day. Now I want to tell you something. Light under a bushel is light that cannot be seen. Salt that is not put on food and looks nice in the shaker, but until it comes out of the shaker and touches the meat or touches the vegetable, it doesn't do any good. Oh, hear me today when I'm preaching to you the Word of the Lord. Huh? You cannot just build a little compound and say, we're just going to exist and just, we're just us four no more. God never intended us as a church to be that kind of mentality. But God said, I have made you battle ready. I have raised you up for such a time as this. Uh, I have sent you among the wolves uh, to preach the gospel that has power to deliver and power to set free. I mentioned it. I'm going to mention it again during the years of COVID that we've come through. And I don't know if we're through with it or not. Uh, I know a lot of it's ugly politics and people making money in government trying to take democracy, at least in our country. I understand all of that. Uh, but we were tested greatly. We were tested by the devil that tried to test the church and to see those that were committed, those that were soldiers, those that had steel in their backbone, those that said no matter what comes against us, we're going to stand for what's right, and we're going to live for God no matter what. Uh, and the devil tried to find the weak ones and to pick them off and, and tempt them and discourage them. And God stood back and tested us also. And he said, I'm anxious to see which ones of my children are going to step up to the podium, going to step up to the base, going to step up to the line and say, though none go with me, still I'll follow. Though none live this life, I'll still walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that God was able to see the hearts of a people that I'm preaching to and said, well done, good and faithful servants. Uh, I am pleased with your consistency. I'm pleased with your prayers. I'm pleased with your desire to live for me. I'm pleased with your ability to stay the course even when things got rough. Uh, oh, hallelujah. God is looking down on a people today that have walked and stayed the path through this time that we've lived. Now in prayer this year, I have been praying about this year that we're going into. 
And one of the things that I feel so strong, I've heard a lot of people say, you know, we've, that's behind us and we're going to have a great year. And, you know, we always like to be positive and, and we like to be optimistic. And, and, I like, and I'm pretty optimistic most of the time. But I feel God in my spirit keeps saying that there is another storm that is brewing that is about to break loose on this nation. I feel, I feel it in my spirit strong. I prayed against it, and it, and it seems like God says it's, it's not for you to pray against the storm. The storm is really something that I am bringing to pass. Uh, and, and so he'll use the enemy, and he'll use the evils and, and the principalities and, and the forces of hell and evil spoken people, but he's going to bring the storm because it's in the storm that people are able to see the miraculous. <laughs> you don't ever see Jesus walk on water when the sea's calm. Hear me now. You don't ever see Jesus taking a stroll of leisure uh, just to pass the time when it's a nice evening and the sun set just right and just a gentle breeze and the sea looks like glass and Jesus says I think I'll just go out there and have a little exercise and walk out on the sea of Galilee oh it's so peaceful out here no 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 the only time you ever see him get on the sea is when there's a ship that's about to go under when the winds are blowing like hurricanes and the waves are up higher than they should be and his people are in a boat and they're scared to death for their life and the Lord says, I'm just going to walk down by them and let them know that I'm, I'm near their side. Everything will be all right. Uh, you, you never see the Lord get up and speak to the winds and say, peace be still when they're not blowing. You don't see Him heal blind eyes when you have 20-20 vision. You don't see him straighten out crippled limbs when you don't have crippled limbs. You don't see him raise the dead when people are living and laughing and having a good time. Hear me now, I'm preaching to somebody today. And we want so bad to see God move and to see the supernatural, but something in us revolts against the conditions that bring the supernatural into being. But God says, I'm allowing a storm to come in 23. I'm allowing there to be a storm that will begin to rise up uh, because in that storm, I'm going to test and prove my people and allow them to operate and use their faith and show them how great I am and how mighty I can be in their situation. And in this passage that I was reading to you this morning, there was something that was so significant about this. It says in verse 5, it says, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah. Everybody say, saved Noah. The eight person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Now, now I want you to know something. The way that God saved Noah was the very same thing that destroyed the wicked. He saved him by a flood that floated an ark. And the same flood destroyed the wicked. God draws a line even when the same comes between his people and the people of the world. And, and Noah, God said to Noah when he finished that ark, he said, all right, Noah, you get in that ark. And Noah got in that ark. Now, Noah had got a plan from God. Hear me now. And God told him what to do. And then Noah went about and did what he could do. He did his work. You see, if he didn't know what to do, he could have never done what he did and built an ark. God gives us truth. God gives us His Word. He gives us instructions, and he, he tells us what to do, and then we do that. But there comes a point in time where there's some things you can't do beyond that. And he said, Noah, now you get in the ark. And then the Bible says, God shut the door. Now, I don't know if you know how supernatural, because when that flood started coming, 
Do you realize the multitude that came trying to bust that door down to get in? And if that door had been busted down, those floodwaters would have come in and soaked that ship and killed everyone on board. But God supernaturally shut that. I was thinking about this this, this week. If they could have broke that door down saying, open up. And he said, I, I can't open up. I don't have anything to do with this. I built the ark. I lived for God. I preached you. I was obedient. But at this point, it's out of my hands. It's a supernatural happening, and I can't do anything about it. And God saved him when he shut that ark, and he kept the flood out, and he kept them safe inside. And I'm going to tell you, God is going to shut the door to keep the flood out on the people that have built the ark the way he's asked them to do. Oh, I'm not through preaching. I want to lay it a little bit more today. I want you to see this next one. The Bible says in verse 7, and delivered just Lot. I got to thinking about delivering just Lot. How, how did God deliver Lot from the fire and the brimstone and the destruction? I'm going to tell you how God did it. God sent angels. I said, God sent angels. You've got to understand that when you walk with God, and when you have people that pray for you, and you pray for them, and you walk in that spirit, God has the angelic activity that comes in to help his people. You are not alone in this journey, but you are, in fact, in a partnership with the angels of God. And when things begin to happen, and the Bible says he saved Lot, and I got to reading this, and I got so excited about this, because what was happening, it was at the moment in time when the darkness had become so great, and the evil had become so vile, and his soul was so uh, stirred up by this, and he had an uncle that was over there who was praying for him, and God said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to send angels. And the Bible said that Lot hesitated and would not leave the city. You read it yourself in chapter 19. I read it yesterday, uh, the whole thing, and I, I just read through it, and it says he stood there and he couldn't move. He was paralyzed by these emotions because he had lived so long in this, and he knew what was happening, and he knew he needed to go, but there was something in him. He just couldn't make it over the threshold. And the Bible says both of those angels laid hands on him, and they began to pull him out, and they brought him out of the city. And then it makes a beautiful statement. It says, and the Lord remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the city. That's what it says. It says, send him out of the city because he remembered a praying uncle by the name of Abraham. And as I was reading this, God began to talk to my spirit and said, this is where the supernatural comes alive. This is where my people are able to see the things that they desire. Is when the world around them becomes hopeless. The judgments are about to fall, and the evil is great, and, and all around them is a place of great gross darkness that is hopeless, and, 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 and it feels that there's no way to turn, and there's no way you can see a better day, but it just seems like it's all headed downhill. It's in those times that God is able to stand up and allow his people to begin to walk in the supernatural. I want to tell you, Christian Life Center, this is a year of great trial and adversity in the world, not just America. But this is also a time of the moving of God and the great supernatural as we have never seen it before. <laughs> 
We are going to see the activity of God's angels uh, that are going to come down and work on the behalf of God's people. Some of you are going to see the hand of God shut the door and open the door. You're going to hear the Word of God give the direction of what to do, the wisdom of God that is beyond the wisdom of man. And you're going to know how to maneuver through situations. Uh, this is going to be a day of the gifts of the Spirit uh, when the supernatural is going to flow through the people of God uh, and the healings and the miracles and the faith uh, is going to be unprecedented uh, because there will be this great light in the evening time when God begins to move and wrap up this dispensation of the church uh, as he gets ready to bring us home to heaven as a people. Let me take you to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now it says in chapter 2, starting with verse 5, and the setting is, is that there were people that had tried to tell the Thessalonica, tell the church in Thessalonica that they were that the Caesars of Rome and, and the persecution was the beginning of the tribulation and they had not remembered Paul teaching them that they would go through the tribulation, but in their mind they thought Paul had taught them that they would depart, they would be removed before the tribulation and then the tribulation would come. There's always somebody trying to tell you that you're going to be in God's wrath and judgments. They're always going to teach that kind of stuff. They've been doing it for hundreds of years and thousands of years, and they'll continue to do it. Now, if it's a prophet and he's got a word of the Lord, you need to get to the altar and repent. But if it's just one of those people that's off with a doctrine of devil trying to steal your faith, then you just need to ignore them and move on. Church is not going through the tribulation. It doesn't... Uh, teach that in the Scripture. And uh, uh, it, it just is, it's just a, a lie, one of the doctrines of Satan. Uh, the very fact that the apostles preached and lived every day as if the Lord could come to reach the world. They were, they were, they were driven by reaching the world because they felt Jesus was going to return any moment. That, that doesn't sound like they were saying, well, when the Antichrist comes, I have seven years left, and then we'll really have a revival. That's kind of a, a crazy mentality. And, uh, but this is what's going on in this passage, and uh, it says uh, in verse 5, I'm just going to pick up and talk about our role here before this happens. It says, remember you not that when I was with you, I told you these things. So Paul's correcting the people that have sent letters, have been teaching false doctrine, and the fears of the Thessalonica people. He says, now, you know what withholds that he might be revealed in his time. Now, we're talking about the man of sin, the son of perdition that sets himself in the temple as God. That's the Antichrist. And he's saying here, he says, you know now what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Verse 7, for the mystery of iniquity or the spirit of lawlessness is already at work in the world. Only he who now letteth, and the word let there is, is an old English word that simply means to restrain or to hold back. And, and so it says, only he who now, uh, who restrains will hold back until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. And that's what happens to the Antichrist during the tribulation. And so what he's saying here is he's saying that there is a force that is in this world that is so powerfully strong and so mighty that it is holding back the Antichrist from coming up as a person. 
His spirit is at work. And that's what we feel. We feel this spirit of Antichrist. John's generation felt that after all the disciples had died and gone. He was the last living, and he was writing to the churches in general that had been started. And he says, look, he said, it is true. There is persecution, and it is true. There is hardships that are taking place. This is nothing less and nothing more than the spirit of the Antichrist that's already at work in our world. But there is an Antichrist that's coming that will be much more vile than the spirit of activity that's going on. And so in this passage, Paul is telling us, he says, even now there is a spirit of lawlessness uh, uh, that is at work in this world, and it wants to support press and it wants to rebel. You know what lawlessness is in the best example I can think of? It's somebody that wants to have authority but will not come under authority. And we have governments that want authority. They want to pass legislation, but they don't want to come under God's authority, God's governmental laws. We have courts that want to have authority and be the, you know, the supreme rulers with their words at the court and rule on an issue, and yet they don't want to come under God's authority. And that is lawlessness, and it brings in some of the greatest judgment when the judgment actually falls. And this nation is paramount in that kind of thing, where people, even our Supreme Court, when they ruled that homosexual marriages were legitimate marriages, they wanted that supreme authority to rule that, enforce that on people, but they denied the great authority that gave them the seat of authority to even be a judge. Friend, there is a reckoning day coming. There is a hell for every judge that voted that. There is a day where they will answer and be held accountable. And it doesn't matter what they say and what the world says. This is God's world. This is God's planet. And these are God's laws that He set in place that should be followed. And those days are coming. But right now, He is not bringing that judgment to its totality. He's just allowing the spirit of lawlessness and that spirit of rebellion and iniquity against Him to take place. Uh, And they want so bad to come up and personify in this Antichrist and bring together the final ability to have this orchestrated government that tries to rule and dominate the Western world and just impose satanic and diabolical laws and evil. And if the church is not careful, we're just going to sit back and we're going to say, we can't do anything about it. We're just going to have to preserve and live and hope that everything's all right. And then we'll begin to quote and say, look at these people. They tried and it happened. Look at this country over there and look at this. And you'll talk yourself out of a supernatural move of God if you don't believe God's going to use you in this end time. Now, I want to tell you something. As the pastor of this church, I cannot speak for any other United Pentecostal church. I can't speak for any other oneness church, and I can't even speak for a Trinitarian church or any church that calls themselves a Christian. But I can speak for this church by the God-given authority that He's placed in me and the people's confidence that they've given me to vote me as their pastor. And so I speak from that position as an authority under God that is submitted to God to tell you that God wants you to know that He wants to use you this year in 2023, and that God wants to perform some miracles in your life like He's never performed before, and what you have only desired and what you have only prayed for, God wants to show Himself strong, and God wants to use you. Some of you have prayed for, it seems like, a hundred years, uh, asking God to help you and to use you and to be with you. You've asked God for things, so you've got discouraged uh, and you feel like God's never going to answer that prayer and God's never going to do that miracle and you're too old now and you've passed by I want to tell you that God is not forgotten and the time is not past but God's going to use this church to do things that the world is going to be astounded about uh. And you've got to know who you are in Christ Jesus. 
the devil, every time he tries to come up, and every time this law tries to come up, and every time this vial tries to come up, and every time this wickedness tries to rise up, and every time they call good evil, and they call evil good, and they try to brainwash you, instead of sitting there and putting your thumb in your mouth and crawling under the kitchen table saying, me, oh my, what's going to happen? You need to stand up and say, I'm still here on this planet. I still belong to Jesus Christ. I still have a mission and a goal and I still have a call of God to do something that's going to make a difference in the world that I live in. I understand that some people will live in discouragement. Some people will be bitter at God. Some people will fail and and all the stuff like that. I get it. I get it. I get it. I hear it all the time. I feel it in people's spirits. I I feel the Christian voice as it speaks out uh, and it cries out and and it it tells me that, Nathaniel, you're kind of off base, you know, and we prayed for this miracle and it didn't happen and we prayed for that miracle and it didn't happen. We asked God for this and it didn't come to pass. I hear those voices. I'm not deaf. I'm not dumb. I know what people are saying, but I've chosen to listen to one voice that's greater than any other voice. Uh, That's the voice of the Word of God that speaks to my spirit. Uh, And I can't answer why it didn't happen all the other times, but I haven't given up that it's still going to happen and that God's still going to do it and there's still going to be a move of the Holy Ghost. Uh, In the book of Hebrews, chapter 32, the writer says it like this, What what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell you of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, and of David, and also of Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, who wrought righteousness, obtained promises. You know what obtaining promises is? It means you work for it, but you don't let go till you get it. They stopped the mouth of lions. They quenched the violence of the fire. They escaped the edge of the sword out of weakness, were made strong, waxed vigilant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourging, Jay, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain. With the sword, they wondered about sheepskins and goatskins being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in desert and in mountains and dens and in caves and in earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. We got two things going on. This passage was given to us to encourage and stir our faith. And second, it's telling us that with that great amount of faith, whether it was martyrism or whether it was deliverance, they never received what they believed for, but they never gave up. And people are always giving up when they don't get a hold of it. And they're always backing down and walking away and being discouraged and being angry with God and bitter with God and upset because it didn't come to pass. And God put that in there and said, I want you to hear this. Uh, There were people that were sawed asunder, and there were people that rebuked in the fire, consumed those that would have sawed them asunder, but neither one of them received it, but they both kept their faith to the end. Well, I got news for you. We are going to receive the promise. Uh, I said we are going to receive the promise. Uh, They could not receive the promise in the Old Testament because it was not yet time for the promise to manifest. But you see today there is a promise uh, and this promise is unto you and to your children and to them that are far off even as many as the Lord our God shall call and with many other words that he testify and exhort saying unto them save yourself from this untoward generation. I'm talking to you about a promise of a great outpouring of the Holy Ghost that this generation can see. We don't have to wait to the kingdom age to see it but we can see it in this era time that we're living. We can see our sons and our daughters uh, our mothers and our 
fathers, our friends and our co-workers, our neighborhood and our city, and this place filled with the glory of God through the baptism of the Holy Ghost. This is a day of revival that the church is living in. This is a day of the move of God in this end time. You could sit down. I got just a few more minutes. Uh, in the Old Testament, there were not gifts of the Spirit. There were some prophets that God raised up that were used mightily. There were a few people that had faith and got a special miracle. But there was not a generation of people that had miracles within themselves. Even under the law, when Moses was at the top uh, of, of Mount Sinai and he came down, God made a pillar of fire follow them. Uh, God made a cloud over them. God caused their shoes to grow and their clothes to grow. God rained manna from heaven and God protected them and so forth. But none of those people had miracle power in themselves. They were dependent upon one man who walked with God and that man's relationship covered them. Hear me now. That's how they got their miracles. In Elijah time, Jesus said it like this, there were many widows in that time, but he was only sent to one of them. But you see, the New Testament changed a lot of things. Back then it was kind of the shadow and the types, a little sporadic here and there and showing what could be and some men that raised up and there were Elijahs that we loved. One of my favorite characters is Elijah, how powerful he was and bold he was and, and turns a nation back to God. But you look at all of this and if you take all the miracles from, from that, the time of men that produce miracles to that and you put them all together, they still don't amount to just the miracles that Jesus himself did. And here's the difference. Back then, they didn't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the Spirit of Christ. But my Bible tells me in the book of Corinthians that through the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and I want to take you there, chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. See, I, I want you to hear it because I want you to think about it. I want you to believe what I'm preaching to you. I want you to make a difference. Uh, I want you to know that God will use you. God used just the big, the big, the big special prophets back then, but today things have changed. Uh, God's not looking for somebody with a big name or someone that's some special class of, of ministry. Yes, there are apostles and there are prophets and there's pastors and evangelists and teachers that have a special leadership role in the church, uh, but when it comes to the ministry of Christ, uh, God is not separating the saints from the ministry of being used to bring forth the ministry of Christ to the world. <clears throat> and so it says in verse 4 of chapter 12, now the, there are a diversity of gifts, different types of gifts, but the same Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit. There are differences of administration, but the same Lord. And there are diversity of operations, but it is the same God which worketh in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given, everybody say, to every man. <clears throat> that word man, because it's the male pronoun in the Greek, would cover humanity, every person. God has given to every person that has the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit. <clears throat> now, I don't know what your gift is, and I'm not sure I know what mine are sometimes. <laughs> But I believe this book. <clears throat> I said, I believe that book. I said, I believe that book. And I may not be a prophet or an apostle, or, and I don't even know if I'm a pastor sometimes. I, sometimes I don't feel like much of anything, but I know that I'm a member of the body of Christ. <laughs> And I know that I got the Holy Ghost because I prayed in it this morning. I prayed in it yesterday. And I prayed in it the day before. And when I prayed in the Holy Ghost, I felt that it get all stirred up inside of me. So I know that God lives in my heart in this vessel of flesh. <clears throat> Let me read some of these things. Uh, 
but the manifest of the Spirit, the manifestation is given to every man to profit with all. This isn't just for show, but this is for the profit of the church. Not the financial profit, but for the benefit of God's people. For to one, come on, get your Bibles, let's read through it. <clears throat> for to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. To another, the word of knowledge, notice by the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Church, God wants you to have your portion of the gifts of the Spirit. When the church is operating the way that it should, the Spirit should be dividing these gifts, and we're going to have to understand that and reach for that and accept that and embrace that and open to that this year. And quit thinking that it's the pastor's job or, the, or a staff member's job. This is not about pastors and staffs right now. This is about saints of God that are members of the body of Christ that God says, I'm going to use you at work. I'm going to use you and your family. I'm going to use you in the hospital. I'm going to use you in your neighborhood. I'm going to use you with your friend that you're talking to. You are God's body, people. Huh? You are God's body, the body of Christ. And God has divided these giftings to make the body function the way that it should function. Let me take you to the book of Mark chapter 16. Now, some of you may have one of those Bibles that don't have all the Bible in it, but I got it all in mind, so you can listen to me if you don't have it in yours. And you can read the footnote of one of them unbelievers that don't believe in the supernatural. You can listen to the Word of God and you can make your decision what you believe. Hallelujah. There is just a fire in my soul that God wants to move among His people. God's saying, yes, this is, this is the time of storm because I want to stand up in their life and I want them to see me and hear me speak to the winds and say, peace, be still. I want them to see with their eyes the waters become calm and the winds to stop blowing and to know that I am among them and that I am their God and that there is no power greater than me and that I will bring them through this time with a great and mighty strength of my power to deliver and set them on the other side. Huh? Verse 15 says, He said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now the world for us is wherever God puts us. This doesn't mean that we sell everything and go be missionaries and start traveling the world. This means that wherever you are living as a member of the body of Christ, that becomes your world. That becomes your mission field. That means right here in the valley for most of us, this region, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. Everybody say, these signs shall follow them that believe. Let, let's say it again. These signs shall follow them that believe. Let's say that again. These signs shall follow them that believe. Let, let's say it again. These signs shall follow them that believe. I want somebody to close your eyes and I want you to put everything out of your mind except this we're talking about. Uh, these signs shall follow them that believe. Uh, come on, talk to your spirit today. Talk to your soul. Uh, make it a declaration right now. Not just
just a reading of Scripture, but a declaration of the Word of God. These signs shall follow them that believe. <laughs> These signs shall follow them that believe. <laughs> Come on, church. I want you to say it again. You're declaring something right now. These signs shall follow them that believe. <laughs> Let's say it again. These signs shall follow them that believe. <laughs> Let's say it again. These signs shall follow them that believe. Hallelujah. God is going to confirm some things with His people. He's going to back you up with the signs. I'm going to keep reading. In my name shall they cast out demons or devils. Everybody say it. Let's say it again. Let's say it again. Now remember, you're not just repeating it, but you're making a declaration. So you've got to put everything, you've got to put your spirit, you're, you're, you're claiming it when you say it. You're not just speaking it to repeat it, but you're actually embracing it. You're declaring it as a truth that is yours. You're, you're becoming one with this statement. And so it, the Bible says that they shall cast out devils, demons, evil spirits up. These are the believer's signs. I'm going to tell you, you have no business being afraid of the devil coming in like a flood. You have the authority over those darkened spirits. These signs shall follow them that believe. Huh? They shall speak with new tongues. How about we speak in tongues for a moment? Would you do that, Todd? Huh? Somebody cry out and say, I speak with tongues. Uh -huh. I speak with tongues. Uh -huh. Verse 18, they shall take up serpents. Everybody say it, they shall take up serpents. Now, just so you understand, this is not referring to physical snakes, but Satan is considered the great serpent in Revelation 12. That old serpent, the devil, and it goes back to his first name in Eden when he was the serpent in the tree. And this is a reference to the powerful elements of satanic power. And these are not just devils that are casting out like little foot soldiers, but now you're walking up against the principalities and the powers and spiritual wickedness in high places, and you don't have to be a afraid of any level of demonic power as a child of God. That's what this is trying to tell you as a saint of God this morning. Now if you happen to grab one by the tail and it's in the natural world, this will work for that too. But that's not what you go out to prove like some of the snake handlers and stuff. But this is referring to dealing with that. Then it says, if they drink any deadly thing. Everybody say it. If they drink any deadly thing. It shall not hurt them. Make that a declaration. It shall not hurt them. Now I want you to look at this last part. They shall lay hands on the sick. They shall lay hands on the sick. This is not maybe they'll do it. It says it's a statement of fact. They will lay hands on the sick. This is part of the business of the body of Christ. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Now, I have seen through the years, we have prayed for a lot of people that we laid hands and they did not recover. I've seen sometimes where people tried to cast demons out and the demons wouldn't come out. And they wrestled with them and got wore out and just left it in there and said, well, they don't want deliverance. And that may have very well been true. But for every experience and every failure and every time that it didn't work, you are faced with a test. 
that says, well, I join the unbelievers against the Word of God. Or will I persist in believing God's Word until this thing is flowing the way that it should flow in my life? Now, the world will mock you for that. And a lot of church people will mock you for that. And a lot of church people will get bitter when it doesn't happen the way it should happen according to them. But what's funny is most of the time people get spiritual and want miracles. And that becomes consumed and they want God to move when there's a storm. And then when the storm goes, they're worried about building bigger homes and making more money and having more fun and taking bigger vacations and getting more stuff. And if you don't do that, you're rare because that's mainly what humans do, right? If we would live like we were on the edge needing a miracle every day when things were good. You see, there's got to be the breakthrough of this. My dad was a godly man, a righteous man. I laid hands on him. I prayed for my dad. God didn't heal him. God took him home. I know what it's like to Pray and, and, but you know what? I can honestly say I never got upset with God. I never got discouraged with God. I never got bitter at God. You know why? Because my dad preached this message and he believed this. He taught me to believe this. He taught this church to believe this. And I'll tell you why I didn't get upset with God. And here's the main reason. I have a relationship with Jesus. And I never judge God. I never judge God by my human failures or setbacks. I judge God by one thing, His Word. And if this doesn't seem to work out the way that it says, it's never on God's end. It's always on man's end. And I have a little saying that may help some of you, especially a couple of you today. I feel in your spirit you're really going through it right now. Your life does not commentary the Word of God. I've been saying that for years. My life does not commentary the Word of God. And that's why I get right back up and I preach healing. I get right back up, I preach the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. I get right back up and preach God will see you through. Because more often than not, I see God taking us through to the other side. And it seems like the older I get and the closer I get to the coming of the Lord, uh, and the more that I walk with God, it seems like we're beginning to see more and more supernatural things begin to happen. Uh, and, And God is beginning to do more things than He's ever done in this realm and this life. Uh, There is a special activity of the angelic world. But if you're all soured and and, 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 and all bent out of shape, you're not going to understand it or be able to partake of it. And you're going to be stuck back on base one where a prayer you prayed didn't answer and you're still mad at God, shaking your fist at Him and saying, God, why didn't you do this? And I just don't understand God. You're a weak person if you're like that. That's just my opinion. Now, that ain't the Bible. That's just my opinion. I think that you need to be saying, God, whatever the reason, it doesn't matter. There's a whole lot of life in front of me and I'm going to believe the written Word of God and expect you to do those kinds of things. And I'm looking for the greatest days of my life. Uh, I still believe God's going to fill this church up, not on a landmark conference, but on a normal Sunday morning with people having to come early because they want a seat in this building. I still believe that thousands are going to get the Holy Ghost. Uh, I still believe this is a house of miracles. Uh, This is a church of miracles where miracles happen, and I'm not about to let go of that. Uh, And, it, and, it, and you just gotta, you just gotta have, you just gotta make up your mind what side of the word you're on. You're on God's side or you're on the negative side. You're on God's side or you're on the other side. But you gotta come to that place where this is what I believe. This is what God says, and God's word is true, and I'm not gonna let go of it. Tom. Well, I preached a long time today, haven't I? <laughs> Let let me close it down here. 
God is looking for a people. God is looking for a people that He can raise up in this end time. He wants a people that will be full of the supernatural power. We can't, as a people, compete with the political world. They're too powerful if we just take human on human. They have too much power, too much legislative power, too much control of the voting boxes. We, we can't compete against it. We can't compete with the celebrity world. They control all the agencies. They have all the ability. We can't get our voice out half the time. The news agencies are not conducive to Pentecostals and oneness in our faith. If anything, they're going to mock and make fun and belittle. And every once in a while, they may tell one little story and let it get through because God wants that way or, or whatever. But, and honestly, there ain't a way in the world that we can keep up with the world if we comp compete with them in their methods. I hope you understand that. If we have to fight with their rules and we have to perform with their actions and do with their ways, we've already lost before we begin. What I'm trying to tell you, and I think you already understand it, is we don't have an option of how we approach this. We either are going to have to have the supernatural and incredible faith and walk in this, or we're going to lose. And I still believe that the Bible teaches there is a great move of God that is just hovering around the earth, and somebody's faith is going to pull that funnel down in their area. And this is not a time to be weak, to be frail, to be discouraged. And there's people that things have happened in the past and they just cannot get over it. And they've just, they just are faithless. And I have to be careful that I don't get too hard on them. But I can't allow that. It's like a radiator that it radiates out the heat. They radiate out negativism and pessimism, and they radiate out God can't, and, and they always go back to these, what they consider failures. There's only one voice, and that's the Word of God. And we've got to let the Word of God. That's why we take this offering and we declare those things. Because week after week, somebody's coming to us and say, God made a way out of no way. God did a miracle when nothing else would work. Why, why, why is that happening? Because somebody is letting a new voice besides the world's voice talk to them. And if you get in this book and you let this happen, it is going to bring a new voice to you. Praise God. Now, if you're at home watching, I want you to stand to your feet right now. And if you're here and you want God to use you in the gifts of the Spirit, I want you to stand to your feet and come down to the front. This is our greatest year. And I know some of you, you're like me. You've prayed. You've fasted. You are so sincere like I am. Some of you more than I am. For the move of God. But it's like the enemy has just done everything he can to wrestle your faith from you and to take it. To where when you read some of this stuff, you almost can't feel it anymore. It's almost like reading it in a state of numbness. And you know what? That's where the enemy wants us. He wants us there. 
Some of us have suffered with sickness in our own bodies. That's the hardest to get healed, you know. It's easy to have faith. Not easy, but it's easier to have faith for someone else. It's tough to have faith for yourself, especially when you're in pain or hurting. You know, we walk in when you're feeling 100% good, and boy, you can bleed for that sick person, and that's why we lay hands on each other because sometimes we're able to have greater faith. But when we're the sick ones, you, you know if you're honest, it's tough to have faith when you feel like you're, you can't go much further. But in this world that we live, there's two things going to happen that have been happening, but they're going to keep happening. Is there's going to become a greater antagonist and darkness, but there's also going to become a people that are going to be more vocal and going to see God move and have greater moves than we've ever seen before. And so we have to get to that place where we're going to walk in this. And God said that he would deliver us through supernatural powers. When Peter wrote in 2 Peter, and I read to you, God knows how to deliver the righteous, it is a direct reference to the deliverance that come through the angelic deliverance that was sent to him in the Old Testament. And God saying, the way I delivered him in the Old Testament through the angels is how I'm going to deliver my people in the new covenant. The day of angelic activity is stronger today than it was in the ancient times. It's more moving and it's more involved than it's ever been. And I want God right now in the name of Jesus to open our eyes in the name of the Lord. Open our eyes to understand and to see the chariots of God's fire that surround His people at this time. God, open the eyes, take the blinders off, cause us to see that there are more with us than there are with them. God, today, would you pass out the gifts of the Spirit uh, to everyone that's in this altar? Uh, God, give us the burden. Give us the knowledge. Give us the understanding of the gifts that you're imparting to us as a church uh, as we walk into this new year that the ministry of Christ would be carried forward by your people. He uh, greater works uh, than these shall you do because I go unto my Father. He Come on, somebody's charging their generator in the Holy Ghost. Uh -huh. Someone's stirring up some gifts that have been dormant this morning. Uh, someone's stirring up the desire again that seemed to fade away. God's given the passion this morning. Uh, God's stirring up the passion this morning for the supernatural among His people today. Uh.
Oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. God's not through. He's walking among us this morning. Uh, there is an apostolic change that is happening in our midst this morning. Hashakataya bohosata. Hilobokora sikitia. Shatalabasakalaboho. Hitalaboho kora sitalia. Now let me have your attention. I feel God and I feel that passion in us. Now, I do want to say this. I'm mad at the devil. I'm mad at the world and all the ugly going on. And if I sound like I'm being really hard, I'm not, trying, I'm not hard toward you. No, please don't translate that way. I'm hard toward this negative, pessimistic spirit that says what will be, will be, and there's nothing we can do about it. I'm coming after that spirit. That seems to be getting in the church world. The oneness people seems to be getting in a lot of them, and I'm just not going to take that. And it's definitely not coming into the church where I pastor, and I don't believe you as saints want that in this church. I, I believe what the elders had and what the apostle had is a drop in the bucket to what God really wants to do with us today. We're living in times they never faced. They didn't need it to the level that we need it. But this is what I want to pray, one of the last prayers we pray today. Every one of you, that have been walking with God and, and kind of live in at least this thinking, there are certain gifts of the Spirit that you want God to use you in. And Paul said that we should covet earnestly. That means a covet is like a, a strong, real strong desire. We should desire very earnestly for the best gift. Now, the best gift for you may not be the best gift for me. My job and my call may require that I have a gift that is different than your gift, or it operates different than your gift. It may be the same gift, but it operates in a different way in my life than yours because that's the way it needs to operate. And there's some of you automatically think, I want the working of miracles when I say that. You want to go right to the top and have this big, powerful, uh, miraculous. Why do you want working of miracles? Well, that's good. But could it be that sometimes you want those power gifts because they're the most visible and they bring a lot of glory to you and they're, spe and they're spectacular and they make everyone? You know, there's, there's things like that. Sometimes we may want the, the gift for the wrong reasons. And so when Paul said covet earnestly the best gift, you need to know what God's called you to do and what tools you need. If you're an electrician, you don't need plumbing tools in your toolbox. You may like them. They may be pretty. They may be nice, and you like them better than the other trades tools because they look better, but you need tools that work to get the job done that's your job. That's the best gift for you. Now, that doesn't mean God at certain times can make a gift operate when you need it for a special occasion. But what is the weekly, daily gift you need God to do with you? I sure don't want a doctor working on me who's a great doctor, but his tools are a, a carpenter's tool. If he pulls out that big skill saw, I'm getting off that gurney and getting out of there. I don't care how good a doctor he is. That scare the devil out of me. I say, no, thank you. I didn't come for amputation. And spiritually, I don't think that some of the tools we're trying to use are the right tools for the gift and the call we have. I hope you understand this. This is practical. But I want us to pray, and God has called some of you. You have burdens for things. I'm talking to people that have real burdens. Yes, I want miracles, and I believe that we should have all the gifts of the Spirit in the body, and some of you will have multiple gifts, and some of you may just have one that works really fine-tuned, but if we'll use them in complementary as a body, just like our human body works, we can do just about anything together as a church to bring Jesus Christ the glory.
And so today, this is what I want you to pray. I want you to think about it for a moment or two before we pray. But I want you, if you need a gift, you desire a gift. And it may be a gift you've desired for a long time, and, and maybe it is the working of miracles. I'm not trying to say don't pray for that, but I, I'm just trying to make you think for a moment. What would be the best gift or giftings for you to do what you feel God's called you to do? I want you to think about that for a moment. Let's give it a five, ten seconds. Some of you just jumped immediately, know what you want. But some of you, what I just said is kind of making you think again. Where have I been working and I feel my burden is, what gift of the Spirit would help me to do that and bring glory to Jesus Christ? I want you to think about that. And you can pray for more than one because I've never seen a, a good, skilled uh, uh, worker only have one tool. They may have one they use a lot more than others, but they have several tools. You may need several to get the job done. But start with that one that's most important for you. And then we're going to pray and ask God. <laughs> see, some of you are taking this extremely serious. I can see your heart on your face. Uh, it's good. This is good. God sees the heart itself. <laughs> And he's impressed. I feel that in here. Hallelujah. The world's got to see Jesus. they got to see his ministry, and they can't see it just by quoting the Beatitudes and coming Sunday morning. they got to see his power at work. And you're the hands, and you're the feet, and you're the body. You're all the world can see of Jesus anymore. This is a special moment for us. And so I want us to pray for the best gift for our ministry that would bring glory to Jesus Christ or the best set of gifts. And I want you to pray for those. And I want you to sincerely ask God. And, and, and we're going to believe that there is going to be the passing out of these gifts. Or if someone has a gift and maybe they don't know it or it hasn't been very regular, maybe God will stir that up in you. And if you do have a gift and you know you have a gift but it's not really operating, ask God to put it in operation in your life. Let's pray. Would you do that? You can lift your voice. It's, God's not afraid of noise. <laughs> I want you to talk to the Lord. Lord, today, I want you to fill us with the gifts of the Spirit. These are your people. This is your body. God, I want you to anoint us as a people with the gifts of the Spirit and the workings of the Holy Ghost and the operation of the mighty God in Christ in our lives, O oh God, that we might be able to do, we might be able to accomplish, God, the will and the work of the Lord in this end time, O oh Lord Jesus. God, there are those today that they need great, great faith for what they're facing. And I pray that you would pour out upon this whole church a great anointing of faith to believe, God, there's some that need the working of miracles for some of their situations. Uh, and I'm praying, God, that you'll hand out miracle gifts today. Uh, there's others that they work and they have ministries uh, where healing is going to be needed. Some is the healing of the mind. Uh, some is the healing of the body. Uh, but they need gifts of healing in different types of sicknesses and disease and mental conditions, oh God. Uh, I'm praying you pour out the gifts of healing today. Day. Uh, others need the discerning of spirits, oh God, to know what they're up against when they pray in the recognition of the moving of God. Uh, God, others need the word of knowledge to know. Uh, they need the wisdom how to operate in those knowledge that you give them today. Uh, we need prophecy, God. We need prophecy. We got to be able to prophesy the word of the Lord over situations, God. Uh, we need the tongues to pray in the spirit. Uh, and the interpretation, God, for the audience to know what God is speaking to us as a people. Uh, God, I'm asking you to pour out of your spirit this morning. Uh, a burden, a desire, a passion for the giftings of the Spirit of the Lord. Uh, Ha ha ha.
Would you pray in the Holy Ghost? Just pray in other tongues for a moment. Uh, come on, let God speak through you. Uh, worship the Lord today. Uh, let your voice lift to His ears this morning. Uh, Come on, let's also ask God to baptize us with His love. We're going to need love in this era of time. God, let Your love fill our hearts toward the sinner, toward our brothers and our sisters. God, fill me with love as a pastor, as a Christian, as a man. I need the love of God to flow like a river out of me. God, fill us with compassion. Fill us with compassion. Fill us with the compassion of the Lord this morning. Oh, the compassion of God. Let it be the motive behind what we do that we are compassionate. That we are compassionate. That we are compassionate. That we are compassionate. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. Well, this will conclude our service today if you want to stay and pray. But I want to challenge you to pray every day for this ministry and these gifts. And I really want to challenge you also to pray for the love of God. It's easy to get angry and lose your love for people. At least it is for me, and I guess some of you are like me as a human. I want God's love, because God is love. That's the top. And we need to pray for compassion. Everything we do should be done because of the compassion. I, I was reading over the holidays or Christmas the, the, the Gospels, and I, can't, I didn't count them, but it seemed like over and over I heard the words, he was moved with compassion. He had compassion. Isn't that a great motive to feel for somebody's pain and hurt, and then have the ability to do something about it and help them. So let's pray for that, and let's let God use us. And um, this is going to be a great year, and, and I know God's going to do great things. May God bless you, and you can greet one another, and, and then go home, maybe get some rest, or do what you have to do. God bless you today.